Hello and welcome everybody to Heckling Hollywood. We're back for a third term and this will be the last one we ever do again. Or at least for a year and a half. It's the sixth episode, Tom. I know it doesn't feel like it because the last time we did a third episode was two years ago. But it has been six episodes. This is our sixth episode. I know, but like, come on. Are we really going to make a seventh episode? I think we will, Tom. Do you know why? Because we still have to watch The Meg. No. No, we went through this in the last episode, Jack. You you didn't smoke a hundred cigarettes, so we don't have to no, watch Tom, the No, Tom, I think the viewers will find that if they go back and just listen to the deal that we made in the last episode, they'll find that the deal was four cigarettes, which I held up my end no, of the bargain. No, no, I'm, I'm almost certain you said a hundred. I did say a hundred. You see, you said a hundred. I said a hundred. And then I said, stop the car. No, you did not say stop the car. Yeah, I said, stop the car. I remember. Mm -hmm. I remember running down the hall. Viewers, do not worry. Although he is being a little pansy ass bitch. I don't know what you're on about. He will, in fact, be seeing the Meg 2. We will discuss it. And he will hate every single second of it. It will be entertaining. It'll be absolutely All for your pleasure. And I don't want it. And I really don't want it. And that's why we're doing it. That's why we're doing it, Tom. For the audience's pleasure. Not no, for your pleasure. I hate it. It's so bad. I you just got to stop. Tom, you haven't even seen The Meg 2 yet. I know. That's how bad it's going to it's be. It's directed by Ben Wheatley. Who's that? He made High Rise. Oh, I I think I remember that. Uh, your boy from Loki's in it, isn't he? Uh, Tom Hiddleston. Tom, Tom uh, Weatherspoon. Tom Fiddlesticks. Yeah. T- Isn't that what's asking you to name it? <laughs> Tom Fiddlesticks. Tom Fiddlesticks. It's t- uh, Tom Hiddleston. Tom Hiddleston. Yeah. I was close. I you said, were. <laughs> Tom Hiddleston. There you go. Yeah. I was close. That uh, sounds like a British name. Hello to any new listeners. This is what we do for the first 15 minutes is we just pick uh what actor. New listeners. Who are new listeners? Who's going to stumble across the sixth episode of a podcast? Me. No, Tom, because you, you look out for podcasts. It's 2023. Everybody and their mother has a podcast. Exactly. I've asked my mother to be on the podcast at this point. It would be very entertaining. That would be very entertaining, especially because she'd just be yelling at me. And then I'll get all defensive and I'll be like, oh, no, stop it. No. And then she'd bring up Asmongold and say, Tom, yeah. you introduced me to Asmongold. Yeah, she likes Asmongold. And I'm like, ah. That's your work done. You're, you're, you're one of us. That's your work done. Well, that's get ready. Is it about to be a segue up in this bitch? About to be a big old segue because my mum she loves the old Marvel movies, and a part of our what discussion is a Marvel project, possibly the last Marvel project. If Rotten Tomatoes is to be believed, Tom, we had the misfortune of sitting through all six episodes of Secret Invasion. Da da da! I know. Roll the intro. He is a scroll. How long have you been in here? Tom, what was your opinion on Secret Invasion? I, I, All six episodes go. It's... No, Tom, what's Secret Invasion about? Okay, uh, Secret Invasion. Where's Samuel Jackson? Let let me talk. Let me talk. I'm gonna I'm gonna give you the elevator pitch. Samuel Jackson disappeared. Then he came back. Then he disappeared into space. Now he's back, and he's really old. And they decided, oh, we're going to de-age him a shitload of times. And then we're going to show him in his life and show his relationship between him and the green shapeshifter people called the Dishkrill. And it's going to be a metaphor. It's going to be it's a commentary. Uh, Kobe Smulders is there, but then she dies. And then, Spoilers. And it's the first episode. Hey, man, <laughs> that, that, I, that's like saying the dog dies in John Wick. Man, I'm the sorry. Spoilers. Man, I'm sorry, but like if the uh, if the viewing numbers are to be believed, yeah. nobody has watched this. Nobody saw that. Nobody's watched this. Now that could either be people had a lot going on, uh-huh. which I doubt. People rarely do have things going on, or it could just be the wheels are coming off the train. Yes, this was like the least anticipated of the Marvel TV shows, Easy, and, huh? and it is like the least uh, successful in terms of like critic opinion. Everything. I think She Hulk had more viewers. Miss yeah. Miss Marvel had more viewers. Mm-hmm. Just oh wow! Like you have to really you have to stoop low to get to these kinds of numbers. Very low. You need you need to have an AI generated intro to get to these types of numbers. And to be fair, it's not the first time Marvel have had uh, an issue with people maybe not turning up. 
mm-hmm. the Ant Man movies people haven't traditionally turned up for. Oh, but two out of three of them are pretty good. Yeah, and then Quantum Mania earned like the least out of all of them. And I think this year, of any other year, because it. Mm-hmm. We saw Thor, Love and Thunder, and we were like, oh, no, this might be. But we also saw Guardians 3 this year. Mm-hmm. We were like, okay, so there is still some some gas left in the tank. Yeah. Um, uh, I stand by my statement that uh, Guardians 3 is the closest thing we're getting to a smooth exit off the Marvel pipeline. The, the end game Infinity War is the most obvious off-ramp to be like, and it's over. You close the book. But of course, Marvel keeps want to make, keeps wanting money, and wants to keep growing, so they're making more. Guardians Three is the closest we're going to get to a legitimate off ramp, because James Gunn is also leaving Marvel, so you get the sentiment of like Marvel's over from Guardians Three because it's James Gunn is over, and it's like I don't think there's anything's going to be a big success. After Guardians 3. At least in my mind. I mean, it's it's also... It's not like we haven't enjoyed some of the projects. We both liked Doctor Strange 2. Sam Raimi mm-hmm. back back after 10 years. Quite enjoyed that. Fun wee movie. Uh, we enjoyed the likes of WandaVision. Mm-hmm. Um, we, re- we actually really enjoyed She-Hulk. She-Hulk was, She-Hulk was great. She-Hulk was a very fun time. We really enjoyed that. But yeah, I think... It's a clear sign that people just don't care anymore, mm. um, and I don't, I don't know if they know that they're sick of it. I think yeah. they just see something that they're they burnt don't like. out. They're burnt out, and I don't think I've ever seen as big a crowd not realize they're burnt out because mm. they just seem to be asking for, for other things. They're like, oh, we don't want this, and then they get that, but then they're going, oh, I don't want this either. Mm-hmm. I just want something good, and you're like, no, no, what you want. Is something that's not cute what you shit. need is a nap. What go to mean? bed. It's it's ten p.m. It's past your bedtime. Go nap nap. You got school in the morning. So why are you on Reddit talking about She Hulk as a fifty year old man? Please just go to bed. <laughs> yes, go to bed. Just go to bed. Go to sleep. Oh, we are evolving. Your kids are crying in the other room. Please go and see them. <laughs> we are evolving the touch grass meta. We are now going to the take a nap meta. Go take a nap. Have a nice rest. Come back and then maybe talk. To I you. think I think that's the good way to go about things because everybody knows what a nap is. Mm -hmm. I don't think some of these people know what grass is. No. Uh, And the kind of grass they think is like, no, not that kind of grass. Don't touch that grass. Actually, if you want to touch that grass, because then you'll definitely have a nap. So by all means, touch that grass if it means you're going to have a nap afterwards. But you can skip the middle, man. You you can go straight to napping. You can just go straight to napping. Yeah, Yeah. 100%. Yeah, in terms of Secret Invasion, uh, I don't know if I could tell you like the intricacies. Yeah, what what Um, went on. Because the ep- the first episode begins and Samuel Jackson returns from outer space mm. and he walks out and he's like, "Bitch, what the fuck? Mm. What's 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 up with Earth right now?" And then he gets in touch with Ben Mendelsohn who needs to fire his agent because my God, he is in so much crap. Yes, and he's, he's way so too, good. He's way too good. He's he's probably the best part of this show. Yes, because every single time he speaks, you're like, "Oh my God, he actually takes this stuff seriously." But no one else does. Mm. Everybody else is like sleepwalking through this shit just for a paycheck. It's it's borderline embarrassing. Mm. Uh, Emilio Clark, oh, yeah. just a non presence. Uh, Kingsley Benadire, who is yeah. was in Barbie, he was uh, in Barbie, a bit. Yeah. he was fantastic as um, Malcolm X, I believe, mm. uh, in One Night in Miami. Fantastic in that. Uh, just a non presence here. Just just so. There the, is the, nothing threatening about him in a lot of his situations. He is not really shown to be like any way intimidating close to Thanos or just any ex. I, honestly, I'm I'm still a bit confused. Uh, another person that's in it, Olivia Coleman, it does a great job being like uh just British lady, but she, especially in the early episodes, mm-hmm. she had a more intimidating presence than Kingsley Benadire. I kept thinking like. Oh, Kingsley Benadire is going to be the fake out bad guy that they're like, oh, we're this guy leads the scroll rebellion. We're gonna go fight him, and they defeat him by episode three, only to realize Olivia Coleman has been playing both sides of the field like a wee puppet master. It wouldn't be the first time a Marvel show has done that. I know um yeah. was it 
Luke Cage, the first season of Luke Cage. Yeah. I think it was Cottonmouth, played by... Oh, who plays Blade? Uh, Blade. I want to say Marcus Ali, but that's not his name. Mahershala Ali. Oh, Mahershala Ali. Mahershala Ali. Mahershala Ali. <laughs> I was sitting here like, Wesley Snipes. Wesley Snipes. <laughs> was like, Marquez got... Brownlee. <laughs> and KBHD <laughs> is Blade. Um, no. Yeah, Mahershala Ali. It was like... I think it's like 16 or 20 episodes. It's quite a long season. But halfway through, Cottonmouth goes, gets croaked. Yeah. And then Diamondback or Diamondhead or is Diamondhead like a Ben 10 character? I can't remember any of this shit. This was like 10 years ago. But he comes in and he's now the, the big bad for the yeah. second half of the season. It's It's a pretty normal recurring thing in TV shows to kind of keep the pace up, to kind of keep you guessing. But... The issue there was Cottonmouth was a far more interesting character than Diamondback yeah. was. And in this sense, yeah, Olivia Coleman, it feels like she's in a different show. Yeah. Because the show doesn't quite know what to do with her. And you're never quite sure whenever she's on screen, what's your whole deal? Why am I watching you? Like, And yeah. it's not in a thriller sense of like, you know, you're very interested in what's going on. I think that's what really hurts this show. It's just... A whole bunch of nothing mm. that leads to uh, two superpowered beings punching each yeah. other until one of them just punches right through the other and then mm -hmm. that's the end of it. Yeah, we will get through the worst of it first before we say any of our positives because, uh, haha, retention, baby. But, yes. There's like one, there's like a couple of positives, I guess. There is. But, yeah, the fight, the finale fight, again, we're going to say spoilers, but like, were you going to get that far? Who cares? We we sat through that, like, reluctantly. And we are the most intense, like, if we watch something, we'll normally finish it. So the fact that we were like, ah, oh, really? One more episode? It got to the point, and we'll reveal later on in the episode why the final episode maybe stings a bit more. Mm. But something happened to us between episode five and episode six yes. that really showcased just how terrible Secret Invasion is. But uh, to keep it in its own vacuum for now. Keep it in its own vacuum. The big bad at the end, which is basically what Kingsley Benadir has like all superpowers. But then like bites, a whole vial. Yeah, he has the, the harvest, which is DNA samplings of like all the Marvel characters that we've seen. And he puts it into this reactor and now he gets the powers of all of them. But who was also in the reactor, whatever it happens, is Amelia Clark, disguised as um, Samuel L. Jackson, as Nick Fury. It, it, it gets weird. Basically, they decide, it was like, this is going to be a really overpowered thing. So we're going to give it to two of the main characters. And then they're going to fight with all these powers. And even in that scenario... It is the most dumb fight scene ever in terms of powers that get used, the weird fluctuations between how lethal something is and how safe something is. Like, the finale of the fight, like, the final punch is, like, I believe... Um, it's like a Captain Marvel. Yeah, it's like, a Captain like Marvel. laser blast. Thing. Yeah, straight through the stomach, and he's like, oh, he's dead. But I think we both went, but wait, didn't you, like, get blasted by that same thing before? Yeah. Wait, what? Yeah, you're right, the... the we're not normally, I think we both agree, we're not normally the kind of people to go, well, this power doesn't make any sense. So mm -hmm. this, you're definitely more powerful. We believe that the writer is the one that chooses who wins. Yeah. Because normally it's not the powers that, that are the, the reason for winning. It's because the underdog gets the yeah. upper hand using their, their smarts mm -hmm. or something along those lines. This there's wasn't always that at all. A, There's always a narrative backbone to any fight that allows you to show it. That's why a lot of shows even something as general as like Sherlock is like, we know Sherlock will win at the end, but it's how Sherlock gets to that position is where any of the narrative comes up. You and can't, it's the same in a fight. You can't have every film or TV show be Infinity War where the yeah. shocking ending is, oh, they lose. You can't have that. Mm -hmm. They always kind of have to win in the end. So you're absolutely right. You go back to other projects, for example, like a Doctor Strange, where the interesting thing is the way he wins is by losing over and over again in this strict yeah. time loop. That's a very interesting way of doing things. The end of Guardians 2 is very emotional mm -hmm. because it's got that father dynamic where it's uh, it's Quill and it's Yondu and it's Ego. So you've got that trifecta going on, but there's always something else going on mm -hmm. 
to make all this big action stuff not only entertaining but also have it have some weight there is nothing here no and they they attempt they attempt it and i can see the attempt because all the pieces are there yeah so again spoilers if you care uh talos dies <laughs> Yes. Ben Mendelsohn said, I'm taking my paycheck yeah. and I'm scrabbing out of here. I think it was episode four he dies. I believe so, yes. Yeah, so he's, yeah. he's I'm out his, of here. His whole character arc is just to posit the idea of like, if we ally with the humans, the humans will help us. And he dies with that belief. So then there's the whole lot of conjecture of like, what was his belief correct because he ended up dying because of it? Or... Does him dying not affect the core belief that humans well, will help? The the mod thing, and I I see exactly where they're going with it. Um the the thing with it is I think I would have responded to that more if he did die via Well to a human actually, yeah. Via via a human. Yeah. Because that would show oh, but like it's because they're human beings aren't evil because uh they're xenophobic and all this. Mm -hmm. They're because they don't understand. They don't have all the facts. They are told to shoot, and they shoot. They are doing what they're told. That's that's the way it's always been. So the fact that uh, Kingsley Benadir's character is the one... Gravik? Gravik, yeah. Gravik. Ironically, Gravik has no gravitas. Mm. There you go. That's my one joke of the episode. Good. good, good I'm, luck. I'm happy you got it out of the good way. Good luck quite. getting any more out of me at this mm. point. Uh, maybe later. Um but yeah, Gravik killing him just, it doesn't really further any point. No. Gravik just kills him and then, but that doesn't further anything. But if a human killed him, okay, we'd have something here. But it yeah. was the, it was the fourth episode. You have two episodes left. And you've already spent $212 million <laughs> on, on the whole thing. Yeah. Of, what, three hours of content? Mm -hmm. Yeah, as, as a quick wrap up for uh, um, everyone who watched our previous episode, which was Oppenheimer and Barbie, mm. both of them combined were around two hundred million, weren't they? Both of them combined would have been about two hundred and forty million dollars. Uh, and I completely forgot what we're talking about. Secret Invasion. I was like the Nick Fury show. The Nick Fury, um, the Nick Fury Power Nick Invasion. Uh, <laughs> Nickelodeon Invasion. Uh, Nick Fury's journey to the center of boredom. Uh, <laughs> he looks like he's about to fall asleep. Cost the same, yeah. <laughs> like they cost the same amount, which is completely crazy. To you see could, you what could, you can do. You could make Oppenheimer twice and still have a cool twelve million left over for whatever you want to do afterwards. You buy a boat, spend that on the fade out guy. You yeah. know, get get some weekend essentials and, <laughs> and just party it up, man, to celebrate you making two there Oppenheimers. <laughs> That's what you need, but no. Because I, I, I want to get this across to the people, okay? Because they, let's be honest, most of the show is trying to be this um, this thriller. Mm -hmm. uh, it's trying to be this political show about two different sides, but the scrolls represent both refugees, but also terrorists. Yeah. And you're like, uh, and it doesn't know how to juggle these because it's a Marvel show and it's only six episodes and it's like three hours and you're like, uh, it doesn't know what to do. I want to get across. The final fight is is classic Marvel formula. There's always a big fight, and mostly it's hero and villain who is basically the same as hero. That's kind of the way it's always been. Yeah, I think Iron Man, Thor is like that. Uh, they're all like that because yeah. you've got to just fight the same person as you, apparently, because that's just how it all goes. In the final fight, where what's her what's her name? Amelia Clark. I always forget. Is she Gaia or is Gaia, Gaia her mother? No, Gaia's yeah, her yeah. So she's yeah yeah. Because I remember Ben Madison Goya, Goya, Goya. Because they let him speak in this Australian accent in this yeah. Goya. Uh, Gaia uh, reveals, haha! I it was me, Gaia, the whole time. I am. I was disguised as Nick Fury, and I was pretending to have radiation sickness. Haha! -ha, graphic. Yeah. You. You idiot. <laughs> you stupid you prick. You buffoon. <laughs> you buffoon. I have tricked you. I, I was the imposter all along. Because she does the whole like grab fist thing. Yeah. Which I did in, in, in my own movie. Because that's how stupid that shit is. Jack, do not plug monitors to you. I'll yourself. plug monitors to you all I want, man. It's on the channel. I no. Don't, I do not care. Stop. Oh. Please. And but no, no. We're getting sidetracked. We're always getting sidetracked. Focus. Focus. Give me in one good thing about uh, Nick Fury's power hour. I'm not giving any good one things. One thing. No, no, there's no... One thing. No, no, about his power hour? 
Yes, the Nick Fury Power Hour, also known as Secret Invasion. Oh, the whole show? I thought you just meant like that one Oh, no, fight. no, not that one bit. No, because I, he wasn't even in that fight. No, I just kept forgetting the name. So yeah, this I've is got a new name. Secret Invasion Power Hour Nick Fury special. Yes. The Nick Fury Christmas special. Mm-hmm. No, Tom. One good thing. We're not getting on to the... We're not getting on to the good things, okay? Because oh, there's most likely not any good things. But we will say our whatever good things we have. But I want to point out, because we said it in the beginning, the fight happens mm-hmm. and they just keep punching each other. Yes. And it's a whole big thing. But there's never any emotional gravitas. Even though Gravik killed, what's his name now? I forget, Talos. Talos, yes. Talos, whatever. That's Gaia's father. It's oh, So there should be some level of... There should oh, be sticks. But that never gets... No, I, I never feel like that's established, and that could easily be, like Gravik easily getting Gaia down, be like, "Oh, you're weak. You're weak. You thought you could. You thought you could do this. You're nothing but a weakling. You're like those pathetic humans." And then she gets like some flashback to her and her and Talos, like when she's a young kid, and yeah. he's like showing her the something, something to get like the emotion going, where she's like, "I'm gonna, I'm gonna power through. I'm gonna do it." But she just stands there, like. Mm-hmm. like this the whole time just like i'm gonna defeat you now. Uh, audio listeners he's waving his hand over his face w- waving my hand because it's just yeah. emotionless there's nothing and i don't blame amelia clark i don't blame kingsley benadir i don't blame King, King, uh, kingsley benadir for his performance no because he apparently had no direction and he just decided to go full-on jared leto balls to the wall i'm gonna do whatever i want because why not this is basically play school and then he does and it's terrible but I can't blame him for it. This whole show from the from the AI opening sequence, which we skipped every time, yes, because it's just horrendous, to this big final fight, which looked honestly so cheap, disgustingly cheap, mm. to the confused plotting, to the cliffhangers that aren't even cliffhangers. It's just and it it should be studied. It should be studied around the world of how not to pull off one of these programs it's just horrendous now tom would you like to say something good about secret invasion the nick fury power hour christmas special part one i thought ben mendelson did quite a good job he did he did he did good well one of our early compliments in the show was the fact that any bits that we liked the most basically were just two people sitting in a room talking that's where you got to give credit there are really good actors in this show and really good actors, even with fairly bad script, direction, anything, they they can sell something s- some percentage of the time. So any one-on-ones between Nick Fury and Rhodey, Nick Fury and Ben Mendelsohn, um, Nick Fury and Olivia Coleman do a great job. Sorry, I keep saying Nick Fury and then another actor. It's a Samuel Jackson every time I say Nick Fury. <laughs> uh, and Olivia Coleman. All these people are doing a phenomenal job. And we do get some really good one-on-one moments, but everything else around it just falls so flat that it drags down even, like, competent acting and competent dialogue scenes. Like, what was the scene we really liked uh, in the car where he's talking about, like, yeah, all the stuff he'd done and then... <laughs> um, yeah, the, and then, and then um, you, you Samuel Jackson it. is like... It's just like, it's like, all I would, would like is just, thank you, <laughs> it's just like, thank you, Nick. You're welcome, Talos. <laughs> and it just seemed like Samuel Jackson woke up for a minute. Yeah. Or but, or, or it's the whole part where Ben, in the, uh, that scenario, is going on. It's like, all I need is a thank you. Blah, 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 blah. And then he's like, why have we stopped the car? And Nick Fury's just like, it's because we're here. <laughs> You've been talking for five minutes that you didn't even notice that we already got to the destination. Can I get a thank you? <laughs> like that, that bit, we ended that scene, which was just a little bit in a car going from one location to another. And we were like, that car ride was more entertaining than like the entire final episode. Like Kobe Smulders dying doesn't feel like anything because she's immediately kind of forgotten about. Yeah, yeah. she has the funeral and whatever. But even that's like glazed over. I'm like, she's like a war hero. She's like a very famous yeah. person. Like, wouldn't this be bigger? That's the weird thing about this whole show is that for as much as it cost, it feels so tiny Mm -hmm. because they get all like the world leaders and they get them into like a bunker and you're like, oh man, like this could have been like, you know, not to bring up, you know, a a superior filmmaker such as Nolan, but even in something like Tenet, 
Tenant, you would have the same conversation being done on multiple continents between multiple people. Mm. And it's just edited and the, the pacing of it. And you're like, whoa. And you're just it, taking in all this information because it's visually being told to you in so many different unique ways. And the dialogue scenes in this are the best parts of it because every time they do action sequences, yeah, horrible, shoehorned, terrible. Um, the stuff with the powers... Yeah, and like Not Gravix good. whole plan, like that's terrible. Rhodey stuff, uh, where you find out Rhodey's a scroll, doesn't amount to anything because no. he just gets shot in the head at the end, and that's it. And you're like, all right, okay. Mm. All I was thinking of was, wait, the president. This is Dermot Mulroney, but isn't Harrison Ford meant to be the president in Captain America Four? Well, how's he gonna die, or is he just gonna leave office? What's gonna happen there? And like I should be interested in the show, but all I could think of was that. Yeah. I'm like, where's Harrison Ford? Is he gonna appear in this? Where is he? It's so so insane to me that again, this was the first Marvel project after Guardians 3. Mm -hmm. And I get that they don't have any, you know, they are just different teams entirely that are working on these things. Yeah. But to go from something as emotionally resonant as that, probably the most emotionally resonant thing that uh they've done since WandaVision. Yeah. Uh to this which is just so devoid of any any intrigue any mystery any emotional arc you have the stuff with nick fury and his uh, and his secret wife mm. which we were like oh they could do something with that but as you say it's just it's missed opportunity after yeah. missed opportunity i i believe we had the conversation at the very beginning that like the whole concept of scrolls and their ability to change appearance it is an interesting concept that you could bring to a show. We brought up the idea of um, having something similar to something like Spielberg's Munich, where it's a lot of like political espionage mm -hmm. and a mix of like talented Mr. Ripley, where once these scrolls change into that person, I think they have some weird tech reason that they can like share the memories or whatever. Oh yeah. Cause they, they just are those people. Yeah. They're just, they're just them people that we thought like, it would be really good to follow a singular scroll, even for like the first three episodes. To be fair, you got you got pacing and stuff. Even having a standalone episode, which is Gravik's first mission, where he is ordered by Nick Fury to kill an innocent person. That stakes that story because he brings it up in the final. To obviously, it's not Nick. It's, yeah, it's guy in disguise. But he brings that up, and I'm like. Why didn't you show us that? Yeah. Why couldn't we see that? That would have been a great... Imagine opening the show like that, seeing Nick Fury in a much darker way yeah. than we've ever seen him. Because we've always seen him be like the... We're going to unite yeah. the Avengers. Where we're going to get a team together. But that's always with the heroes. If you get a group of Skrulls as a team together... I'm doing quotation marks. Uh, getting that team together is a lot more like getting five people and being like, you're my subordinates. I am going to force you to do these things because you're not, you're doing it for the good of humanity, but you're not human. And that is an interesting way to see Nick Fury because uh, you, compared Nick to seeing Fury, him as like the superhero guy. You're absolutely right. Nick Fury becomes in graphic size. He becomes what humanity is. Mm -hmm. Humanity is dark, violent, the exact thing that they were trying to escape from whenever they escaped from, because uh, they had the big war going on with the Kree. Yeah. They tried to escape their home planet from the Kree to come to somewhere with some sort of salvation. Yeah. And they find, well, are humans really any different from the Kree? And like the ending of the show where the president basically orders like all scrolls to be executed. And then there's like uh, uh, the vigilantes who are like shooting, yeah. uh, you know, members of, uh, parliament around the world because they think they're scrolls like that should have had such a a huge weight to it mm -hmm. where you're going oh fuck look what's look what's happened yeah and instead it just feels like nothing i a, a seen that could have had 10 times higher the emotional stakes than anything we saw in this is the fact that uh nick fury's wife in the show um it is a scroll and that's a part of it but we are shown early on that there's a very specific poem that she reads to Nick Fury about like, um, about like, do you love yourself as yourself? There's the words around it, but there's a very specific poem that she read on like their first date or their first anniversary. And you tie that back to Nick Fury being stuck in a room 
with two scrolls, one of which is his wife and one of which isn't, and they both put on the same disguise. You now have them going around and he is like, yeah, you gotta kill one. You, you have that situation where he can't tell until he recites the poem that they say in the first date and she continues it and then he kills the opposing one. This could also become a benefit of like maybe their relationship Oh, we, we kind of see their relationship was more troubled at the beginning. Yeah. Because he's been off planet for so long. You, you you can see so many gems and gold mines that can fit into these ideas that are just non-existent in this. And it's not like they needed. It's not like we're we're suggesting a complete because you're absolutely right. We're not suggesting a complete rewrite. Yeah. All of these pieces are here. Gaia can still be there. Talos, absolutely. Yeah. Talos and uh Gravik are essentially the Martin Luther King and Malcolm X. Mm -hmm. Ironically, King Zimenadir did play Malcolm X. Mm. I don't know why he didn't play him like a Malcolm X, to be <laughs> honest. It's a bit weird. But all the pieces are here. You know, even with uh, uh, Nick Fury and his wife, like that stuff it can be there as well. All the pieces are there. It's just done so matter-of-factly. I'll mm -hmm. oh, get the script written. I'll get it out. Uh it's just mind blowing. I, I think this. If anything could kill, could kill Marvel at least on TV. Yeah, this could be it. Like this is just shocking to the point where as soon as the episode ended, I think they released uh, a hundred thousand minutes until Loki season two premieres in October. Yeah, because they're like, all right, that that failed. On to the next right. thing. And Let, then, let's sweep that under the rug real quick. Let's forget about that. Exactly. But then Loki season two has. Jonathan Majors in it. Yeah. Like, I, you ain't edited him out of that. And he's got his own <laughs> problems. So I can only imagine Kevin Feige ripping out what little remains of his hair on the top of his head yeah. under his big baseball cap. Like, oh no. Well, my, and my empire is crumbling. Mm. Movies haven't earned a billion dollars since 2021 when yeah. Spider Man Homecoming or what was it called? Far From Home. Far From Home. No Way Home. Way no, home. Way ho no Way Home. I don't know. So they're, yeah. They all have home in the title. It's just, oh man, I don't even know. Um, and then the, the release calendar for Marvel coming up just looks horrible. Uh, not just MCU projects, but you've got like Madam Web, Craven the Hunter, you got, yeah. got delayed, Venom 3, uh, Captain America 4, which who cares? Uh, Thunderbolts, who cares? It's just who cares? And then there's Avengers movies that are coming out like yeah. a year after. It's like, who cares? It's really not a strong position to be at as like a movie studio. And there's not a lot to come. There's maybe Loki will have something interesting, but it's a real gamble at this point. We're, we're not in the same position we were. I'd, I'd say even, it was like a year, two years ago, whatever they done. Uh, whatever uh, WandaVision came out. WandaVision. It felt very bright. It was WandaVision, Falcon and the Winter Soldier and Loki, if yeah. I remember right. Those three feeding into each other i believe as well i i think i didn't miss a week where i wasn't watching like a new marvel sh uh, episode whenever those three came out that felt like a solid like block of uh marvel tv it always comes down to you get the sense that there are people and it felt like that way in loki season one as well there was somebody behind the camera there's a group of people behind the camera who really wanted to tell this story who wanted it to look a certain way feel a certain way and that's what made people really excited about them. Something like WandaVision, I still absolutely adore. I yeah. mean, the first two episodes just being oh, straight up top quality. classic Dick Van Dyke, you know, TV episodes. So good. Such a retro throwback, but so interesting as well. And even then when they start, you know, delving into uh, more of the MCU-ness of it, it's still very engaging. And then you, you know, flash forward two and a half years to now, and it's, it's just depressing. And it's not like there isn't areas where filmmakers come can come in and still do great work i stand tall that what sam raimi did with doctor strange 2 yeah super fun because it wasn't this big thing it was just a nice simple yeah. movie everybody was expecting there to be tom cruise's iron man and all these cameos and it's like yeah the, it, it, it wasn't grandiose no but it was entertaining super entertaining super entertaining nice and simple mm -hmm. a nice simple plot the cameos that come in they all get absolutely dispersed yeah they just get demolished immediately and i i clapped i applauded i was like this is so good you get the wong transition you get which is the, one the, of my uh, favorite 
pieces of c- uh, cinema. That's to that the- Raimi goodness. Yeah. That's that Raimi goodness. And then you cut to this. And it's like, it's the most depressing smash cut in history. Yeah. Because <laughs> it's so sad. Because I remember seeing, I didn't see Iron Man in the cinema, but I did see The Incredible Hulk. Hmm. And I stayed for the end credits. And seeing uh, General Ross in the bar, all depressed about what happened. And then seeing Tony Stark walk in, I was like, oh. I was like, what? Ooh. No way. And I remember the lead up to the Avengers. And obviously this is when I was a kid, like, but the excitement that they were generating with these individual projects and then finally seeing the Avengers. And I was even still excited up through Age of Ultron. And I think they still managed to do that up to Infinity War and Endgame. Like 10 years of just projects building on each other, still having their individual identities and then coalescing into just a, a massive 10 year franchise ender yeah i just think now it's now they had the opportunity to go a lot weirder with it like a wandavision and they just what was the werewolf one that they did a one werewolf by night or werewolf by night was weird it was like a one-off episode of michael uh, giacchino yeah who's typically a a composer he directed it yeah no it was was phenomenal because yeah exactly they just gave him like a small budget and went you just do whatever you want Mm -hmm. and it was really entertaining it was a nice wee short thing uh, the Guardians of the Galaxy Christmas special with yeah. Kevin Kevin Bacon. Wonderful little bit of weirdness. That's the stuff that I'm like, I dig that. Mm-hmm. I dig that. Whenever they just, and Doctor Strange as well, like just do nice weird stories. They don't all have to be interconnected. I don't really care in these end credit scenes when you're introducing, you know, like Harry Styles as, as thanos's younger brother or something like i don't even know like yeah that's the weird thing yeah you i saw your fist yeah what what was that that's in the end credits of eternals oh it is yeah (laughs) that's never happening yeah doctor strange 2 ends with doctor strange 2 had a great ending where he screams and the eye opens up yeah and you're like oh what and then they immediately ruin it in the mid credit scene by having him be fine and in control of it and then Shirley theron turns up and you're like i ain't never seeing you again yeah. It's starting to feel like DC, man. Where like all these promises of what what could have been. And you know that DC's not doing them anymore. But Marvel, you're like, oh, I don't think it's going to happen either, man. Yeah, I think we're coming to the end of it because we have just seen a summer where Oppenheimer has now outgrossed Mission Impossible 7. Mm-hmm. Uh, Oppenheimer's going to outgross Ant-Man and the Wasp. Barbie yeah. is going to outgross everything this year, most likely. Uh, the Marvels that comes out in November isn't going to get any IMAX screens mm-hmm. because Dune is going to have them exclusively yeah. for five to six weeks. A Marvel movie can't get IMAX screens now. Insanity. R.I.P. No. R.I.P. Man, the, there's the going to be nothing the goat left. Has fallen. The goat has fallen. Ibra, make sandwiches. Don't stop making fucking sandwiches. Yes, sir. I'm going to make three sections, okay? They're going to be wet hot and sweet all right i'm gonna take green tape make those sections louis yes, i want sir. you to get the sandwiches put them oh, in the corresponding shit. sections Poppy. okay yeah, yeah. Behind. Yo, sweet bag Ooh. sharpie label that shit please chef yes sir Tina, fire every single chicken we have please okay yes, richie sir. do you even know how to do fries yes i know we need them now okay um marcus where are we on cakes uh get in there getting there what the fuck do you to move on to the special little piece of heaven that has cheered us up after it in between episode five and episode six of secret invasion because uh we were able to basically binge watch them since they were you, already out you text me on on what day was it so secret invasion I came out it was on wednesday thursday on thursday yeah yes because i believe i text you because you were you were down home yeah um and I text you saying, "Yo, just remember to watch Secret Invasion because I'm I'm not waiting." Yeah, and I'm not gonna I'm not gonna wait for there to be two episodes to watch. I don't want to put myself through that. Mm-hmm. One episode of Secret Invasion a week was enough. Yeah, but you text me to watch what show? I texted you to watch the bear. Oh my god, we're talking about the bear as if you couldn't tell by the thumbnail and the title. And oh the- wow, what a big oh, surprise! What a, what a sh- shocker that is! As if you haven't been staring at the poster for the last 45 minutes and that's why we're talking about the long way around starring ewan mcgregor where he goes on a motorbike around the world the long way the long way up the long way up the, uh, the, way the other one he did but no uh before we get into the bear i i want to have a a wee small um not rant but a wee 
bit I want to explain to you, Jack, and the audience, is that for two weeks in a row, uh, yeah, for two weeks in a row, I I described whenever we watched Oppenheimer that I had the audiobook of Richard Feynman stuff, mm-hmm. and we are now talking about the bear, and I have the audiobook of uh, Anthony Bourdain and his time as a chef, mm-hmm. and I, I was on the bus up listening to Anthony Bourdain's uh, audiobook, I'm thinking to myself, wow, two top uh, phenomenal movies and TV shows about uh, topics of nuclear war and uh, about how hard it is to be a chef are two things that currently exist in my audio library that I've listened to and enjoyed. And I thought to myself, hmm, I wonder if we have any other predictions in my audiobook library. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> that are going to show like what's going to be the next best thing actually yeah let's let's take a wee pause tom can you get up your audio library yeah I let's let's phone. see yeah by all means let's have a wee look because you've you had the richard Feynman book and richard you Feynman. had anthony bourdain's book mm-hmm. and we talked about oppenheimer we're about to talk about the bear so we have 1940s nuclear warfare we have chef a chef a chef What's next? What's uh, next? If we go through general ideas, because I got a lot of really boring like business books that I don't think would come up. We have ones on poker. I have both The Poker Brat with um, Phil Hellmuth and Maria Konnikova's The Biggest Bluff. Uh, the introduction of the idea, kind of like a Molly's game of um, poker, could be something that comes up in the future. Again, we're speculating here. Uh, I have Liar's Poker, which was written by the same guy who did The Big Short, if I can remember correctly. Can you tell correctly. this guy loves poker? I, I really like poker. Listeners, can you tell? To be fair, that one's about finance and the bond market, but hey, new Adam McKay. Mm-hmm. Adam McKay did Big Short, didn't he? Oh, do you have anything about uh, the GameStop thing? I actually don't. You I actually don't, don't care about that. Oh. <laughs> Sadly, I do There is a movie care. coming out for that. Um... I have Charles Bukowski in here. Maybe we'll get like a Charles Bukowski. A Charles Bukowski biopic could be kind of interesting. Haven't they already made Fear and Loathing in Las Vegas? No, that, that's Hunter S. Thompson. Aren't here. they the same that's people? That's different. Though. No. Aren't they the same people? They're completely different. Aren't they essentially the same people? No, they're different. Aren't, are you sure about that? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I would I would very much like to see a, a biopic that's just a, a reimagining of his first book, The Post Office. That would actually be quite good. Uh, again, we're spitballing here. Moneyball, they should make that into a film. Oh, they should make that into a film. Yeah, and, oh I'm, my God. and I'm going to watch maybe, it multiple maybe get times Arnold a year. To write it. That'll be quite Cast good. Brad Pitt. Mm, I have the creative act by Wick Woban. By Wick Woban? Wick Woban. And... Hmm. Isn't that the guy who doesn't know music theory? <laughs> he is the guy that knows it so well that he doesn't have to explain He's it. He's the guy that knows it so well he's forgotten all yeah, Exactly. He couldn't keep it in that brain of his. And I think that's pretty much of the major ones. I have ones that have been turned into stuff. Like I've got On the Road by Jack Kerouac. Maybe we can get a new one of that. I know the first attempt didn't go so well. And nah. That's pretty much it. Pre- pretty much it. Uh, a lot of the ones I actually end up reading are either because, or listening to, is because I watch a film that was based on it. So I have Fear and Loathing in Las Vegas in here. And I have, although, of course, you end up becoming yourself, which was the end of the tour, was based on that. Okay. And so we, we, we've got a, a handful here that have already been turned into films. Hey, you know what? Why not? You want you want a Don Quixote film? There is a Don Quixote film. Yeah, but you want a new one? Uh, Terry Gilliam. Tim- already... Timothy Chalamet is Don Quixote. I'm just going to do the cast of Dune, but in Don Quixote. <laughs> I mean... Uh, uh... Don Quixote, the Terry Gilliam one that he made, was Adam Driver. He wasn't Don Quixote, but Adam Driver was in it. Oh, for some okay. reason, I associate Adam Driver and Timothy Chalamet together for some reason. But uh, I don't know, Tom, do you want to download the audiobook to Killers of the Flyer Moon and give me some info on that by the time we watch that? That would actually be quite good. I, I, I didn't know there was an audiobook of it. That's based on a book, so I assume there is an audiobook. Oh, yeah. But yeah, hey. There's audiobooks based on everything. You can use your one Audible credit that you yeah. that you keep getting from Audible because you keep threatening to cancel. 
Oh, sorry, I didn't mean that. Audible, please, please, please sponsor I us. pay monthly. I do my thing. And I was going to bring up, this would actually be a great ad read for Audible if we were sponsored by Audible, which we are not. Audience yet. members. Yeah, yet, but... You never know. Yeah, we, we might have to we do are, this again. We are an audio-only podcast for now, so maybe they'll look at us and go, hey, these guys are... Yeah. They're, they're keeping audio alive. They're on to something. They're on to something, even though Tom is a podcast listener you actually watch your podcasts while you play well i I, I put it on the second monitor while i play second monitor content yeah while i play really difficult video games like only up jump king and pogo stuck and yeah and then those it, are all basically the same game they're all pretty much the same they're game. All the same thing you just gotta go up but they're they're the perfect uh perfect week game to watch or uh, watch or listen to a podcast to because you could end up making no progress in two hours. So it's good. And I've seen you make no progress. I have, in two I have hours. not made progress on Pogo Stuck for like four days in a row. And I've been playing like two hours per day. I've, I've gone through a lot of podcasts and I'm in the exact same position. It is very difficult. <laughs> yet, yeah, ladies and gentlemen, that's what, that's what we do here. Yeah. We, we take in a lot of stuff, but we're in the exact same place as we were. Yeah. Nothing about the stuff that we consume has any impact on our lives. Like and subscribe. Okay, do you want to talk about the bear now? Yeah, it's time to talk about the bear. Okay. Okay. So, it's not about a bear. No, there is a bear in the opening shot. There is a bear in the opening shot. And I believe there's a bear in the last shot, or one of the last shots of the last episode of season one. Yeah. And then it never gets brought up again. That's good. Because it's a m- metaphor. Mm-hmm. Metaphor. Nobody puts Barry in a corner. In a so cave. the bear is about family. It's about family. And it is a, we follow Carmi, who is uh, the younger brother of the family, who is really into cooking, goes off, becomes like a Michelin star level uh, chef, and gets kind of traumatized by the whole event or the the whole scene and basically has to come home because his brother has um killed himself yeah i I didn't know how to put that politely for um the youtube audience this is the second week where we've had to talk about something where somebody has killed themselves and it's had a massive impact on the main character yes i can't wait to watch who would have thought the meg's gonna be the exact same thing no no don't we're getting sidetracked but yes, uh, this his, is intentional. His, his, his brother, his brother has committed suicide, and he comes back to basically run the kitchen that his brother ran and refused him to uh, work at. And who plays? Who plays his brother? Oh, it's, it, it, he's the boy that's um, in that meme where he sits in the chair and screams, "No, no, 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 no! Please, no!" Who is it? Oh, John Berthold. <laughs> yeah. He hey, is. I knew it from the meme. You knew him from the meme. Yeah. Well, what else is he in? There we go. He's in. Uh, he's in the Punisher. He's in Wolf of Wall Street. Uh, he's in The Walking Dead. Uh, the Sheen. Walking Dead. That was the one. He's in a lot of stuff. He's a very oh, good yeah. actor. Mm-hmm. He's, but he's from that meme too. He's, he's, <laughs> which is from the Punisher. Oh, that's from Punisher. That's from the Punisher. Oh, okay. I don't know. Um, do you think from. memes come out of nowhere? Yes. Do you think AI just generates memes now? Yes. And that's that's exactly it. where. <laughs> it's it's either AI generated or it was written by Simpsons writers almost fifteen years ago. But no, his, uh, he has to come home and basically deal with the, the trauma both emotionally and physically by having to look after the kitchen while processing his own emotions of his brother committing suicide and not being in his life anymore. And we get this great look into the struggles, uh, the different problems people have in their own lives and how they kind of meet in this angry concoction that is uh, a Chicago kitchen that is on the brink of shutting down and owing people a lot of money. And it is the perfect environment for great storytelling. This is a show that we consumed most of a season and a half at least yeah between the fifth and sixth episode of secret invasion yeah so i remember texting you 
saying, hey, you know what? The fifth episode of Secret Invasion, it's not great, but it does get things moving. I didn't hate everything in it. I wasn't depressed watching it. Maybe this this yields good things for the final episode. And then we watched, uh, we both individually watched season one of The Bear. Yes. Which, to be fair, we did watch two episodes of mm-hmm. like a year ago. Yeah, it was uh, a good while ago. A, a good while ago. Uh, but with season two coming out, that must be what caused you to go, oh, I'm going to watch that. Yeah. You, you can watch that. Well, it's because the first one's like eight episodes, I believe. It's I, short I, enough, yeah. Yeah, it's like three, four hours if you sit down and watch it. I, I watched all of season one in like a single sitting. I, I did not. That was... No, I actually did. <laughs> <laughs> I did because I told you I was going to start watching it, then I didn't watch it until... Uh, yeah. Until Sunday. Yeah, because I, I messaged you then to be like, oh, I'm really excited to watch season two, but we should watch it together. So you have until I come back up to uh, get to the same point as me and then we can watch season two together. And it was just wonderful. It was phenomenal. It was wonderful. It was wonderful watching season one uh, separately. It was a wonderful, Mm -hmm. it was a wonderful four hours of television getting to watch season two together after seeing season one uh, apart. Mm -hmm. It was so good to be able to see the growth of these characters. Yeah. Um, I think I said to you that this season two is probably one of the greatest sophomore seasons. Yeah. Possibly ever. Uh, shows usually don't find their footing until season three mm-hmm. or they just fa- fall off because season one was just way too good. You know, you think of a true detective, you think of a Westworld, you mm-hmm. think, you know, all these shows that had really good first seasons and then just immediately fell off. This was a different beast. Uh, they didn't just try and redo the first season no. again. This was There was a, a dramatic attempt to really forward what was happening. Mm-hmm. Um, There's a great, like, I don't know what the word is, but you know whenever, sound pretentious, you know whenever like a caterpillar turns into a butterfly, it's like a metamorphosis, I think. It, metamorphosis. Uh, yeah, right. a meta, like almost every key character that was introduced in season one has a very significant and prominent like metamorphosis in season two where it's almost like they took season two as the idea of like, these are the characters you know. I don't think they don't really introduce anybody new into the main staff. Not really. But they show how every single person changes Mm -hmm. and that just builds in such a far more satisfactory way. Anybody that they introduced physically in season two mm-hmm. they've already mentioned uh Car- yeah carmy's mum mm-hmm. is still mentioned in season one mikey you don't see he's always mentioned he is a yeah eternal presence throughout the entire show but you only see him towards the end of season one properly mm-hmm. um and that's kind of a surprise like whoa john they got you. john bernthal uh cameos play a massive yeah part but it's unlike again we, we just talked about a marvel thing the cameos here don't just stop at oh my god that person yeah it's it's like oppenheimer it's mm-hmm. you go oh my god that person and then they proceed to give a terrific performance and before you know it it's you're just in the story again yeah it, they never distract from what's going on i do want to bring up season one is very much the the sandwich shop yeah uh Carmi comes in and Mikey basically didn't run the place very well at all. He wasn't good with money. All of the people that they get their meat from, uh, their their produce from, everything, uh, their napkins, their forks, they just don't want to yeah. deal with them because they're not reliable. So Carmi has to come in and pick up the pieces. He finds out that uh, his uncle, uh-huh. uh, Mikey actually borrowed $300,000 from his uncle and his uncle is coming in going, yeah, well, since you've took over the place, you owe me three hundred thousand dollars. And him and his, uh, um, him and his cousin, his his cousin mm-hmm. in quotes, uh, have to go and do like birthday parties, and they have to do st- uh, stag do's, hen do's, yeah. things like that, just to pay for pay off that debt essentially. But I love that Carmi as a Michelin star chef comes in, and you can see him. He's not even trying in the beginning yeah. to turn it into its turn it into what it would eventually become yeah he's, he's just, just yeah he's, he's just trying to run it he's brute forcing almost yeah how to do it while completely ignoring the facts of the situation yeah like instead of uh like he's coming in and he's doing 
some of the things that he's used to. Yeah. But he's not doing it with any sort of order. He's just, well, I know this, this, and this. Because maybe other people in his restaurant would have done these other things. Yeah. So that yields the arrival of Sydney, mm-hmm. who is the the yin to uh, Carmi Yang. Yeah. They just work so well together and they have this constant butting heads, but they come from the same idea. They both studied at uh, the CIA, CIA, Culinary Institute of America. Yeah. That's a joke they bring up. Um, so they're, they're on the same wavelength and it's Sydney that really goes, listen, I just randomly made this very thick document yeah that has ideas for takeaway that has this that and the other and it's only after a little bit of nudging Mm. that he goes okay no this can this can really be something and really the rest of season one is just trying to convince the other people that this place can be great Mm -hmm. we just have to really start caring about it but the thing that i really appreciated about it not just that but the the idea of being a Michelin star restaurant and being a Michelin star chef and working there usually comes with just a lot of stuff that isn't really nice. It's a lot of anger and it's a lot of frustration and it's stress and it just leads to being surrounded by a lot of toxicity. Yeah. And that's showcased in uh, Joe McHale has a great cameo where he's just basically abusing uh, Carmen. <laughs> mm-hmm. And you're like, oh man, that's that's horrendous. You watch Gordon Ramsay on TV, and you know that that's something that maybe they play up for the camera. But in a real kitchen, it's that same. happens. Yeah. You know, uh, Marco Pierre White. But plenty of times when you shut those cameras off, I'm very angry right now. Yeah. <laughs> I'm sure Anthony Bourdain was the same when he was a chef. Like, mm-hmm. I feel like you, the show grapples with can you run a successful restaurant without that? Yeah, and you start to see these people caring more. And I think that's what it comes down to. It's not, you know, you've got to do it because you've just got to do it and that's it. They really take the time to show that th- them caring more about that place and their work mm-hmm. actually has a benefit on them. They're happier. They they have more passion for things. And that's really put into perspective in season two. Yeah. Um, uh, well, to point out in season one, there's a really interesting, like, ignorance, both from Carmi and Sydney where both uh, Carmen and Sydney are younger compared to the other people that are working in the kitchen. And there is like an ignorance to uh, reality in a lot of situations where they're just thinking like, if I put in enough effort, I've got the skills. If I just do this and I put in the hours and I put in the time, I can make this place great. And by the end of season one, we actually find out that's not true at all. Everything kind of goes up in smoke. But it's once they kind of settle down, they start to face reality, which I believe is like a very central parallel to the idea of grief and moving on. You can't willfully... You can't just work... Go past grief. You can't put a plaster over it. Yeah. And I suppose that's what... You're absolutely right. That's what Carmen's trying to do. He's just trying to run the beef. The restaurant's called the beef. He's just trying to run that restaurant. Mm -hmm. He's trying to basically plaster over what Mikey had created. Mm -hmm instead of inheriting it Mm. and going, okay, this isn't Mikey's anymore. Mikey is gone. He will always be remembered, but he's gone now. This is my restaurant. And at the end of season one, of course, spoilers. Yeah. You know, we recommend you see this actually, to be honest, on like Secret Invasion. We highly recommend. We highly recommend. If you've already watched it, by all means, keep listening. The end of season one is uh, the beef is closing. Mm -hmm. The bear is coming. Yeah. Perfect way to end. Because it shows that sense of moving on. Mm-hmm. Um, before we get on to talking more about season two, in terms of season one, what are some of your highlights? Because, like, let's be fair, everybody gives a good performance. Oh, we, don't yeah. need, we don't need to say this person stands out, this person. Everybody in the cast, go on Wikipedia, look at all the cast. Every single one of them Great does job. such an amazing job. There is not one bad performance. Everybody, even who is uh, Carmi's sister's husband. Oh, I forget. His Pete? Name. Yeah, it's like Pete or a Todd or something like that. I Pete, think Pete. Even Pete, who everyone just absolutely digs on mm-hmm. and just takes the piss out of. Even he goes above and beyond, especially yeah. in, in season two. But Tom, what are some of your highlights? Uh, I think a very obvious one right off the bat is the water episode. I believe that's episode six 
or twenty seven. It's the it's the one right before the f- the final episode. Oh, so episode seven. That was incredible. That was phenomenal. That was insane. I didn't realize it was a one or until probably halfway through because I was yeah. just so interested in it. It doesn't pull attention to itself, mm-hmm. but it really gives the. Uh, it reminded me of like uncut gems. Yeah, where like that. It's like the rising anxiety. The, the ang- I felt the anxiety because everything just kept going wrong, and the and again that anger that brews up, which again comes from that grief of not being able to. Again, you can't plaster over it. You've got to start anew, and it just keeps bubbling up in everybody. No, that that episode easily is. It, it reminds me as well. One of our favorite films from the past couple of years was Boiling Point, which was again a water done entirely in a kitchen, and. It, a, a kitchen setting seems to lend itself to a water so much more because there's so many things going on at the same time that you can really take your time with the camera, I'd say. You don't have to cut to every situation. If you just let the camera pull back and witness everything, it looks like chaos. You can feel the chaos. I I felt it, um, again, from my from my time working in, in a McDonald's, which is not even close to being a Michelin star yeah. <laughs> restaurant at all. But it doesn't matter. And I think what the bear shows is it's not just Michelin star restaurants that have this level of of uh, of chaos, of chaos, anxiety, just everything boiling up. It's as simple as a sandwich joint, a yeah. McDonald's. And that's where I, I came to you probably years ago at this point. And I suggested the idea of a of a film set in a restaurant. Yeah. Just in semi real time, because the amount of drama that can go on just mm-hmm. from my time at a McDonald's and one overnight in a three hour period, there could be fights on the front fights in the back. There can be people getting injured. There can be stuff where people get stuck and it falls yeah. just so much stuff going on, running out of things. There can be so many things that go wrong and everybody just has to keep their cool because otherwise it definitely descends into chaos. And that one episode was tremendous that for that. It. Uh, no, absolutely. There's really nothing. To, 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 it's just fantastic. If yeah. anybody was going to watch an episode and just kind of one episode, just to kind of see what it's like, yeah, that would be the one. Like, don't it even would. start at the don't start at the start. Even like, if you want to just see what it's like right off the bat, that's the episode because yeah. it perfectly captures what it's actually like working in a kitchen. Mm-hmm. It's oh so stress worthy. Yeah. And I, I've brought it up to you before. In that episode, there's a very specific, uh, particular point when. Sydney and cousin are kind of disagreeing with each other, going back and forth. And Sydney then has like a knife to cut something and accidentally stabs cousin in like the butt. In the butt. In the butt. And he then leaves to go to the front of the restaurant to basically get patched up by somebody else. And the water just does this great follow through, turn around. And then instead of focusing on like the cut and it being prepared, focuses on cousin's face and then cousin is trying to distract himself from what's going on by tell me about the it's like tell me about the war tell me about the battle tell me about the battle again i think he references again like this is a story that he brings up to calm him down or to go through something yeah no yeah because yeah tell me about the battle again yeah and he's like it's black hawk down black hawk down fucking piven yeah fucking piven it's so good it's again it's so Puts so many caps mm-hmm. on itself and it's just perfect, perfect, perfect. So wonderful. Uh, the whole reason that um, that episode really turns into chaos right. is because Sydney leaves the uh, to go, uh, you know, the tablet, the uh, yeah. the, uh, the takeaway tablet. She leaves that on overnight. So it's just all these orders just keep spewing yeah. in. I think she leaves like pre orders on, which pre orders, yeah. Before they've even opened, you can actually set your order, leaves it on overnight. You've got an entire 24 hours worth of orders pre-order and after she ends up leaving and um, richie's getting patched up uh, cousin's getting patched up uh. what's the last shot oh it's the we receipt thing isn't it yep it's carmy beating the <laughs> hell out of it <laughs> yeah. and throwing it away and i'm like perfect it's, uh, cinema <laughs> yeah cinema on the small screen and, and again that whole Thing, tries to show that even with Sydney, he's kind of like, oh, I understand how we could do to-goes and to-goes could be profitable and it could help us get out of bad water. There's so many, every single character has their own problem going on in their lives or with the people at the restaurant that something as 
drastic of a change as adding to go stuff can destroy like the entire fabric of the kitchen carmy wants he wants this place to be great but he doesn't want to take any risks yes sydney is impatient and she wants things moving super fast and you can see that by her wanting to have a a dish on the menu and Carmen says it's not ready yet it's yeah. not ready yet and she and gives, it, gives to it, it away so she's just impatient she wants things to get moving and that leads to to obviously that happening yeah. then you've got um cousin just misses how easy it was at the beginning like they might yeah. not have been making money but at least they like they had a job and that leads to just ev- once everybody around him is really liking what Carmen and Sydney are doing with the place yeah Richie feels like he's just left in the dust because as is shown, he can't really do anything. Yeah. He's not good at fixing things. Mm-hmm. He's not good. He's not good at making the food. He's he's not trained on anything. Mm-hmm. So he's just not. He feels, and you really, I mean, that's that's a character that really you feel for mm-hmm. that sense of being left behind. The one, the last thing that he thought would leave him is kind of yeah. Is he's kind of watching it drive off and in, into a into a brighter future, and he's just yeah. He's he's raging against the dying of the light, you could say. Mm-hmm. Uh, his whole thing is is absolutely heartbreaking, and Richie gets a great uh, arc in season yeah. two where we we are proper, where Richie stands. Oh, like I actually think uh, Richie's episode in season two is probably one of my forks. favorites. Yeah, forks. I think that's one of my favorites of that season. I I I I agree, and that follows up a a great. Uh, oh yeah, an absolutely great one, which is also kind of a semi winner. Uh, yeah, if yeah. I'm, if I'm not mistaken, it's it's also kind yeah. of a. I I believe there might be more than one episode or um, in season two that has elements in it that are like continuously shot, but it never goes for like I, the whole one. It doesn't go for the whole one. Or I uh, the last episode mm-hmm. is like half a one. Yeah, and then it stops at a certain point, which really yeah. puts an emphasis. Uh, the episode before that, which is uh, basically set under the idea that Carmi is telling his girlfriend about yeah. a Christmas they once had, which is cameos galore, mm-hmm. John Mulaney, oh. uh, John Bernthal, Jamie Lee Curtis, uh, Bob Odenkirk, mm-hmm. uh, Sarah Paulson. Sarah Paulson, that was... Yeah. Just a crap ton. And then, of course, you have your uh, your Carmi and, and, um, Carmi and Richie. Yeah, the regular kind. Uh, and uncles there as well. Mm-hmm. Uh, just, again, we're, we're jumping around, but I think the episode where... I'm forgetting his name now. Who's the... Uh, the uh the the dessert dessert oh chef. marcus 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 is like because he doesn't really have anything in season one that we're that we're connecting he, he yeah. gets his his sick mother in season two that we find out about but i love him in season one because it's just as simple as he's just kind of there and he's yeah. doing his job and then carmy tells him about a uh was it a plum or a oh or yeah a, it was a dessert that had like four different four different kinds of the same fruit yeah uh, it was a plum but it was like it, the plum was prepared in four different ways yes yeah. yeah and it took ages but that's the way they did it um and he's really in, he's really interested in oh but how did they how did they get it right and he's like yeah and then eventually yeah. one person got it right and you know what it was and then sydney chimes in because yes, sydney right is away. the same as carm she she knows this but he's blown away by it. Mm-hmm. And that was just be a great scene of him like, oh, that's really interesting. But then all of a sudden, like that one scene spearheads into him just wanting like to make cakes and donuts and really being interested in, it's basically sparked a whole new passion for yeah. him. Mm-hmm. And, at the, and that's something that I love to see. And I love to see him get to go to, uh, did he go to Amsterdam? or He went to Copenhagen. Copenhagen. He went to Copenhagen to work with Will Poulter, yes. uh, another cameo, um, and their scene where they just talk about, you know, how they ended up doing this, mm-hmm. uh, and they just find they're good at it, and, you know, they've both not had, they've both had very different lives, mm-hmm. but they've both ended up essentially in the same place, just because they they love what they do. It's so, so interesting, and it's also the kind of thing that I, I think we were, we were loving that will polter's character was being very firm with him but also yeah. very nurturing it's like no you just keep going yeah you keep doing it and i love that with the tweezers where he's putting the uh is it the small little cracker thing? it's uh i think it's like a slice of almond almond and he just puts it yeah. carefully in and he's like oh no try it again yeah. and he just keep trying it again try it again and, and, and it's, it. it's great as well because there's moments where like you could picture marcus or anybody who 
wasn't confident in it spiraling out of control because Mm -hmm. Will Will Poulter's character has like a way that he is very matter of fact in his uh, feedback. Uh But compared to somebody like Joe McHale, who was like berating Carmi in earlier uh, episodes and being like emotionally abusive, Will Poulter is very much like, that's incorrect. Do it again. That one was worse. He's not saying that one was worse to like berate him. He is telling him it was like that's the opposite direction. Yeah, move in the other direction, and it, that's the way he's explained. It. It was like, no, not good. Try again. Worse. Try again. Better. Try again. Marcus understands. Yeah. yeah, and I think. Do you think that's because he's worked with Carmi, and Carmi also does have Carmi obviously due to you know just him as a person and obviously his family life. Yeah, he has a bit more of a shorter temper mm-hmm. but Carmi has also been quite nurturing in how he yeah and how he talks to marcus so do you think that's that's why he's he's so used yeah. to it he's like because obviously if he came from like a joel McKeel type thing uh-huh. it would be like shocking it'd be like wait what you're not gonna berate me but i love that and i think that goes back to what i was saying about the idea of can you can you run a restaurant where everybody's just passionate and nobody has to shout and I think they show that, yes, it is possible. Yeah. What usually ends up happening is is what happens in your own life mm-hmm. and your own, you know, your own insecurities. And your, that usually is what yeah. comes into it. Um, What's interesting, I had this epiphany there just while I was sitting listening. Uh, I didn't realize this whenever watching, but Will Poulter's main monologue at that point is explaining how he wanted to be the best at cooking uh until he met somebody who was better and then his whole thing was just trying to be as close to the very best which is a perfectly fine scene it never clicked to me because they show photos of it will poulter's character and carby work together yeah carby is the person that was better and that never clicked oh that just clicked with me now you you saying that yeah oh my god carby was the one he saw that was better and he was like all i have to do is get as close to that man then as close, and I stick with him, and I try to get as good as he is. But which I don't like, ever be it. Which is funny, because Carmi, Carmi and Sydney kind of both go through a thing in season two where they're not quite sure of themselves, because they keep tasting dishes, and you yeah. keep seeing them going, oh, what the fuck is that? Oh, that's way too much of this, that's way too... And they're kind of doubting themselves. Yeah. So it's it's so interesting seeing not a character that that we've known, uh-huh. but... The Will Will Poulter's character bring that up, and yeah, it seems so obvious now. Yeah, but yeah, that's that completely went over my head initially. And to be fair, they both and they must have both worked uh, with uh, Olivia Coleman's character. Yes, as well. So they, it's interesting that because um, Olivia Coleman's very similar. Where uh, Richie uh, and again, we'll, uh, we'll, let's talk about Richie's episode. Yeah, because we'll uh, again, they all the episodes are fantastic. They all have something to give. But I, I would say out of season two, even though the Christmas episode is I, I would say incredible. The Christmas episode is probably the best one to go in blind. Mm-hmm. Actually hearing us discuss it might take away a few things, but things like uh Marcus and Will Poulter's character or talking about the Forks episode, I feel like we can get a lot more discussion there. I think the Christmas episode would be better if you're like just take it in as 100%. much as you can. We 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 both absolutely love it. Because Richie's episode, which we will say, the fact that it's called Forks, yes, does tie in with something in the Christmas yeah, episode the directly beforehand, and we couldn't help but yeah, laugh before we laugh. even watched the episode. We were like, okay, that must have been an intentional yeah. thing they were doing. But it starts off, and essentially, Carmi has been sending, he sends Marcus off to Copenhagen. He sends um, uh, your... Uh, y- y- the. Oh, I'm forgetting their names. The the two older, yeah, uh, the two older she, chefs, the the lady and the man, mm-hmm. uh, who we both love. They're very wholesome characters. Yeah, she keeps calling Carmen Jeff, uh, Jeff, <laughs> which is yes, Jeff, which is funny. And like her and Sydney have a great thing in season one where yeah. she has to kind of warm up to Sydney and eventually calls her chef, and it's oh, it's a wonderful thing. Uh, but they all get sent off on their own little missions to to basically to get better and to learn more. Richie gets sent off to a Michelin star restaurant and his job is essentially to clean forks. Mm -hmm. And this kind of infuriates him. He thinks he's too good for it. 
Um, he just doesn't understand. Like, well, well, who cares? Who cares yeah. about this? Who cares about that? And the whole episode is basically him learning that people people come here for the experience mm -hmm. and they come here and the job is not just to serve great food but it's to give them that fantastic experience that they wouldn't get anywhere else and he starts learning about how the servers will listen to the customers and they'll read their body language and they'll think oh you know what you just said something about pizza so he has to run all the way across the street to get a pizza a deep dish pizza yeah. from chicago obviously and and then they make it like a gourmet and then he gets to serve that and he sees the the look on their face and she's like, you did not hear me say that. Oh my God. That is a memory that that person will have. And yeah. he, you see him like it clicks and you see his home life start to get better because of it. he starts to take care of himself. He starts to clean up his apartment and it starts to click for him. Yeah. And that for us, I mean, I think we were pretty much... Yeah, no, we Fist absolutely pumping. loved it. Because uh, Reggie's character, even at that point, we have a scene in an earlier episode that he goes on a date and he's talking about one of his favourite stories that him and John Berthold's character got up to. And it's like, it's a crazy story. It's like a first date for him. And the only thing the girl hears is like, but you're saying you were out till five in the morning drinking and kind of puts her off him as a person. And... Richie at that point really has no self-respect, which was okay whenever he had John Berthold's character because he saw the good in Richie and they were very close friends. They were they were alone together. They were alone together. And now he's just alone. Yeah, and with no self-respect and he felt, he felt useless uh, working at the shop and he had to go to this completely different environment and see how people operate not only whenever they respect the work they do but they respect themselves and that's what we see once he leaves the restaurant is like he might not be in that environment any anymore but he can start to respect himself they do it kind of comically in the show where he just keeps going around being like i wear suits now but that is supposed to be the perfect metaphor for it he's not wearing a dirty shirt to work he's not uh, it's basically him saying I'm different now. Yeah, he's without different. Without directly saying it. Yeah, he's changed. Uh, you even see it whenever, like, once he leaves, uh, he does. He wakes up at the same time and then realizes, like, he has three hours until he has to go to work. And so he just cleans his house. Yeah. Because he's like, well, that's what I do. I'm up. I got to work. And so he cleans his own environment. There's a... There's a, there's a beauty to it because there's a lovely conversation that he has with... <clears throat> there's a lovely conversation he has with the guy that's kind of showing him the ropes mm -hmm. and he says eventually like oh you're not you're not cleaning forks today you're you're going to be serving you know you're going to be monitoring us and they just have a, a lovely conversation and he says oh so what do you want to make food and the guy, i don't want to make food no it's not my thing um, and he says he had an alcohol problem and it's i think that conversation is really the thing that that solidified it if serving the deep dish and getting that all that customer's reaction if the whole big thing was just making him realize it that conversation solidified for him that it's really not the food it's just it's being of service hmm. it's giving yourself something to do that brings some level of happiness to other people and that's what Richie wasn't doing. He was being self-destructive with himself, mm -hmm. which ultimately led to his uh, his relationship going down the drain. He doesn't really have a as much of a connection with his daughter as he would like to. That that the likes of Sydney in season one kind of both literally and figuratively yeah. stuck the knife in about mm -hmm. that really kind of drove him crazy. And I think now with hearing that, he realizes, you know what, I have been self-destructive. And I've not really done anything about it. And I've always blamed everybody else for it. And I've said, oh, well, this is stupid. And why would anybody want to do this? But it's not, they're not doing it for the customers. They're doing it for themselves. Yeah. Because this is what they enjoy doing. This, and Will Poulter says it as well. Nick, I, I did this when I was 16 and I loved it. And I've been doing it ever since. Mm -hmm. You find that thing that brings you that happiness, that contentment um contentment that's the wrong word uh brings it just brings you that joy content print content yeah not you, contempt contempt there we go that's there we go it's yeah. it's, it's, it's 
It's a little bit different, but it's a big difference in meaning. Off topic, very slight thing. I was in work. Do you know <laughs> executor of the will when somebody passes away? Okay. I said executor of the will. <laughs> It's like, no, they're already dead. Yeah. You, know, you don't need to do it again. Small thing, words matter. Yeah. <laughs> words matter, even if they sound the same. Where's William? I've got a job to do. <laughs> <laughs> My work is done. Pay me. <laughs> <laughs> Are you the executor of the will? Nope, that was somebody else. I'm yeah. the executor of the will. <laughs> I'm the executive ex uh, executor of the will. I'm the executive executor executive of the will. Yes, I, I'm, uh, I'm here to make sure that all the executor of the wills go smoothly today. <laughs> I'm here to make sure all the executions go smoothly on this will. Oh, uh, it is the will of heat. Uh, but no, that was, it was just a small thing I wanted to bring up. But in Richie's case, his uh, his journey with, and it was like, what, a week? Yeah. It was a week. It mm -hmm. felt it felt longer, but in a good way. Like it felt like he was there ages, and it just goes to show how quickly. <coughs> yeah. It just goes to show how quickly a change like that can happen. Because mm -hmm. it really did. It was just a light switch that went off yeah. for him. And immediately oh. he wears suits now. Mm -hmm. Also, the whole episode has that really cool setup and payoff of uh Richie kind of looking at the sign that seems a little authoritative, that says every second counts. Uh, and Recurring him, motif. Yeah, like the, uh, the it's, it's actually in the Noma that Will Poulter is also in. Yep. Like that sign comes up in and multiple in, places. Uh, it, what, uh, it's in the Bear. It's yeah. in their restaurant as well. Uh -huh. well that's the finale, but I believe, mm. where it's like they, they get the sign for it. But uh, he kind of looks at it as like a kind of authoritative thing. He's like, oh, these people, all, all they care about is efficiency and all this. And then he has the great one-on-one -on -one with uh, Olivia, Olivia Coleman character. at the end of it. Who she, is better in this yes. than she is in way more scenes in Secret Invasion. Mm -hmm. So there's, this wasn't just random, folks. There's no. connections. You see, everything, it links together. Everything links together. Say the line, Jack. It's it's like a stance. It's it's your line you always say. Oh my God, it's like poetry. Hey. So that they rhyme every stanza kind of rhymes with the last one. If we can get it working, you know. Because yeah, Carmi's yeah. a funnier character than we've ever had before. Yeah, that that is true. Uh, audio listeners, you can mark that off your bingo card. He he has said it, but no. long time listeners, long time for new listeners. listeners, I say that a lot. But to get to get to the point, Olivia Coleman's character has a great one on one with Richie, and tells the story about how her father uh, had a notebook and would write all these beautiful things that he saw in the day, kind of just weird stuff. That uh, just painted a picture of what his day to day was like. Even whenever I believe was, he was overseas at the, uh, at war, comes back, still continues to do it, and he would end every single page with the same phrase. Then she gets called, bit of interruption, and he, Richie, kind of runs after her, asking, "What did he write at the end of the book, or what did he write at the end of the page?" And then eventually he kind of just sits in the room looks up and sees the sign that is plastered on the uh, kitchen from the very beginning. And it's that every second counts or make every second count. Every second counts. Every second counts. And that just solidifies uh, how much more meaningful the phrase is than it just being about efficiency. Like these chefs are here to cook because if they were making every second of their day count, they would be, doing it in a kitchen doing what they love she is in that kitchen and she's peeling uh peeling uh mushrooms peeling mushrooms and he's like oh why don't you have one of your does he say lackeys why don't yeah. you have one of your lackeys do this and she's like i think this is good you know i get up early i do this it it brings everybody together if if you're on the same line doing things uh again teamwork it's not about being above and below it's everybody's on the same track they're just trying to get this moving but she brings up that when the economy went to shit, yeah. she, her restaurant closed and it was a rainy night and she was just across the street and she just so happened to to run across and see the for sale sign mm -hmm. for uh, or to let um, for, for that restaurant space. And she took that opportunity and that's really where that every second counts come from because she could have easily done anything else. Mm -hmm. um, and her and Richie have a great conversation about, you know, their fathers and you know, the military background and... Richie at that point realizes that this person who's the big head chef and 
somebody that he thought he would have nothing in common with. Actually, yeah. there is a lot here. Mm-hmm. So it's not the, the the usual stereotype. And that's really the show telling us yeah. that your idea of what every chef is is really not true. They are just people. They are people who live in who work live and work in very high stress environments. Mm-hmm. But they are just trying to do what they love to do. Um, whether it be serving or making food. At the end of the day, they're just trying to do what they love. And the fact that Richie takes that and he drives home and Taylor Swift plays yeah. and he's singing literally not a single correct word, but he's, <laughs> he's feeling it. And I'm like, that's the energy that we love. That was... That's the energy that we love. And I'll just end it by saying the bear has some of the best soundtracks. Oh uh, yeah. And in, in television history, like they are well on the money for, mm-hmm. uh, for their music. We, we both have enjoyed listening to it, quite a few tracks from both season one and season yeah. two. But to wrap it up, Tom, what would your thoughts be on Marvel's Secret Invasion? Secret Invasion, so good. Yummy. Mm, ice cream. Best TV show of all time? <laughs> no. <laughs> There's great television in this world, and it's not currently being made by Marvel. No. No. We, uh, On the other hand, I'd like to recommend The Bear from the deepest parts of my heart. This is one of the best television shows I've seen in a long time. And we are truly in an age of great film and great television and none of it's being made by Marvel. Absolutely. I would 100% agree. Marvel is doo-doo. Secret Invasion is poopy. Yes. Worst thing ever. Marvel is basically, oh, oh, I put myself, oh, no. Yep. Whereas the bear is, I wear adult diapers. Yeah. I kick a chad. I think ahead. Mm-hmm. I think ahead before I put myself... Which it never does anyway. Never does. It's just never straight hits. Never Every hits episode has something ones. to love. There's never a, a down moment. There's never a moment where you're unsure. It's There's never a moment where it's unsure of itself. It's yeah. a magnificent program. I recommend everybody watch it. It's got something for everybody. Even if you're not interested in food or restaurants, or, it doesn't matter. It's, it's yeah. not really about that. It's about these people. It's about what they go through. It's about them finding the passion in life that they that they had lost it's about grief it's about so many things um we both highly recommend it and we highly recommend you not watch secret invasion yeah uh, don't don't even watch it because it's so bad it's good it's not it's not mm-hmm. that uh we wouldn't recommend that in terms of what's upcoming very excited to say that the meg 2 will be coming no. We, ap- we can't end every episode like the this. episode that you're all waiting for so mm-hmm. look out for that uh there's also gran turismo gran turismo i'm actually excited gran turismo so we'll probably do a little little double episode of gran turismo and the meg 2 so tom just to give you something to 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 perhaps maybe enjoy they could both be terrible we might be in yeah films, but... that's the best case scenario only one of them's terrible <laughs> best case that's that's the best we could hope for here. The best case scenario for me is you hating Gran Turismo and going, you know what, Jack? The Meg Two was <laughs> the Meg actually, Two ain't that bad. The Meg Two was actually Kino. I don't know what I was kind of crying about. <laughs> you know, that, 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 that was a solid film. Gran Turismo, on the other hand, oh boy, that was a big old. Oh boy, Stinkies! Oh no, Neil yeah. Blomkamp, director of District Nine, and nothing else. <laughs> oh, oh no. Anyway, we'll see you guys next we'll time. We'll see you. Thank perhaps. you for watching. Again, don't forget to like and subscribe yeah, if you want know. to see more. They know. I know they know, but you have they, to they say know. it. Uh, leave a comment down below on your thoughts on the bear or, or Secret don't. Invasion, unless you think Secret Invasion is good. If you leave a comment about Secret Invasion, please unsubscribe. Yes. <laughs> please, please don't talk <laughs> Jack, to me. Jack, we, we got so few subscribers. Please do not please say that. Please don't talk to me about Secret Invasion. I don't want but that yes, in my timeline. Uh, thank you for watching, and I hope you have a wonderful week. Bye. 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 I pooped my pants. Big ol' stinky diaper. Oh, can you get the whiff of that? Oh. That's the last time I buy a kebab. And then just go bonkers in my big one. Bye.